Welcome everybody to this breakout session on backup, ransomware recovery, and disaster recovery using AWS. I am Rajesh Vijay Raghavan, a Senior Business Development Manager from the AWS Storage team, and I'm joined today by Aditya Kalyanakrishnan, who is a Senior Product Manager from the storage team, specifically working on S3 services. In my current role as the Business Development Manager for the small medium business segment in Americas, I come across customers on a daily basis and I talk through them through their cloud uh, adoption journey. What I've come to realize is it's not a one size fit all. Some of the customers still are on premises using uh, storage arrays from uh, Hitachi or NetApp. Some of them are hybrid mode into the cloud and some customers have never had a on-premises environment. They're all into the cloud and these are the digitally native customers. So the data protection strategies, it's all different for different phases of these customers' journey. So we'll look into the agenda and this is what we're going to cover today. We shall start off on the topic that's top of mind for all CIOs and storage administrators, which is data protection. We'll look at some of the trends and I'll take you through the customer journey when it comes to cloud adoption. We'll, we shall specifically look into the backup use case and then follow it up with ransomware recovery strategies and then end with disaster recovery of applications and storage using AWS. Now, coming to data, data growth is exponential. We, it is expected to grow to like 175 zettabytes by 2025. Again, for context, one zettabyte is equivalent to a trillion gigabytes. To give you some additional context, between the beginning of humanity to the year 2003, only half a zettabyte was generated. But in year 2013, it only took two days to create that same amount of data, right? So this, this is a huge challenge for all CIOs and storage administrators. Now, I want you to imagine, let's say your business is going to grow 5x in the next three to five years, you might be having 40 terabytes of data or 400 terabytes of data. Do you have all the strategies to uh, protect all that data? So when we talk about data protection, right, what is data protection? It's the process of safeguarding this data from corruption or compromise or any kind of loss. And there should be a capability to restore this data to a functional state in case any kind of disaster strikes. So we are now going to talk to you about why AWS Cloud is important in your data protection journey. Speaking of journey, I'm going to use this slide uh, in subsequent uh, sections as well. Uh, when you think about uh, the customer's data protection journey, uh, typically, in, at least in the small medium business segment that I work on, uh, customers are starting off with the backup and restore strategy first. Um, they want to make sure that there is a store and a protect and then a monetize the data strategy, right? So uh, first phase of the journey is uh, they may be using Hitachi or NetApp or any of the vendors for primary storage, and they may be using Commvault or Veritas for backing up that data currently on premises. Uh, they take that non-production data and back it up to the AWS cloud. Next, building upon these backup strategies, they want to protect some critical information. Think of a product recipe or a client's financial information. They don't want any hacker or any uh, malicious element to take control of this data. So we'll talk about some of the ransomware data recovery strategies and then the, when you think about the cloud journey, customers usually want to uh, prevent any kind of, uh, when any kind of disaster occurs, then they need to have a disaster recovery strategy for all their applications and storage. So this is the typical journey to store protect for customers. They do go ahead and monetize this data using data lakes or they use file services. But today we'll focus on the three phases of the data protection journey. How do customers use cloud for data protection, right? So when we typically look into the on-premises environment, uh, storage administrators have to procure, set up, and manage the storage. You have to budget and prepay for the storage arrays and continue to pay for the support. 
Uh, you don't even have the ability to scale up and scale down depending on your business needs. And most times you end up with less than 11 nines of durability. Most CS CIOs that I talk to, they lament about the mundane task that their storage team is doing on backing up, right? And finally, the cost. It gets really expensive to have two instances or two appliances in two different regions for availability and redundancy. Now compare that with AWS Cloud. Cloud has a pay-as-you-go model. It helps to move from CapEx to an OpEx model. It comes with endless scaling, and uh, it also offers 11 nines of durability. This actually brings a peace of mind to the CIOs that they are able to deploy their engineering towards value add for their customers. Now, let us look into the key metrics when it comes to disaster recovery. Uh, first thing that comes to mind is the recovery point objective. How much data can be lost? This is measured in time. So, for example, if a disaster occurs at noon and the RPO is one, one hour, that means the system should recover all the data that was in the system uh, before 11 a.m. Mostly financial customers that are tracking customer transactions, they want to minimize data loss and they want to have the lowest RPO. Now, when you look at the recovery time objective, it is how quickly you must be able to recover from a disaster. For example, if a disaster occurs at noon and if your RTO is 4 p.m., then uh, you have four hours to get back to normal stage, right? So these recovery point and recovery time objectives, these are not just set by the IT team. Uh, usually companies involve the business teams and legal teams also uh, to sit together and come up with these uh, key metrics. Now let's look into the key data protection objectives for the companies. First one is customer to protect from any kind of human error. It could be accidental deletes. So it could be a storage administrator deleting a table or a bucket uh, within S3, right? Next is uh, making sure there is another copy of the data in case something happens, right? It could be a malicious element. It could be a ransomware attack. So having that additional layer of protection for resiliency and bad actor protection, right? That's also important. Thirdly, having compliance and a governance model. So when something happens, is there a way to audit this and make sure that they have compliance, right, for their legal requirements? So throughout this presentation, we will talk about all the features that we have and how we can uh, uh, go towards these goals. Now, AWS offers a full suite of security features. So we start off with the IAM policies that's going to enable and grant you uh, grant and restrict access to your users. There is multi-factor authentication that makes it difficult for anybody to get into the system through social engineering or by stealing user passwords. Third, we have immutable storage and backups that protect your data. We're going to cover this in detail in this presentation. We also have various encryption schemes offered through key management systems, and these are integrated with all the AWS services. The physical security and digital separation of user roles is also important when it comes to backup access, right? So that's also available in our security framework. Lastly, audit tracking capabilities for compliance purposes and for the legal teams, right? This is also available. AWS has these inherent security capabilities, but we'd also like to remind customers of the shared responsibility model. The shared responsibility model, in this model, what we indicate is uh, AWS is responsible for the resiliency of the infrastructure that runs all of our services in the cloud. This comprises of the hardware, the software, the networking, the facilities that AWS has. But customer also has a fair share of the responsibility. So the customer is responsible for the resiliency in the cloud. You are responsible for the operating system, the updates of these operating systems, the security patches. You're also responsible for the application software that you run uh, in the environment, and also configuring your uh, AWS provided firewall configurations. Even the DR, backup, and ransomware strategies that we're going to discuss today, it is your responsibility to make sure that you have the right strategy. 
Now that we have understand the objectives and the requirements, my colleague Aditya will cover some of the AWS storage features and capabilities that can address these objectives. Thank you, Rajesh. Now let's dive into the features and capabilities that AWS provides you to address your data protection objectives. So you can think of these features we will cover in this section as a set of ingredients that you can use to build a recipe for protecting your data. And this could be based on the unique requirements of your business. So many of our customers start by backing up their data to the cloud as the first step in their journey to modernizing their data protection strategy. With AWS, you can either use your existing backup applications that most likely already support uh, backing up to AWS with minimal effort, or you could use uh, our AWS Cloud Storage Gateway product, uh, the AWS Storage Gateway, to connect your applications to storage services in AWS. And fundamental to storage in AWS is Amazon S3. And Amazon S3 is designed for 11 nines of durability to protect your data in the cloud. And what that means is if you store 10 million objects in Amazon S3, you can on average expect to incur a loss of a single object once every 10,000 years. So it's built to be highly durable. The AWS global infrastructure is comprised of 81 availability zones with 25 geographic regions uh, around the world. And this number continues to grow each year. So what this means is you have globally available storage wherever you need it. And Amazon AWS region is a physical location around the world where we cluster our data centers. And we call each of these logical clusters an availability zone. So each of our regions is architected with multiple availability zones separated by many kilometers. And they're designed to withstand concurrent failures of multiple physical infrastructure components, enabling you to achieve a high level of durability in Amazon S3. So with S3, you don't have to think about maintaining your own on-premises fleet across several geographies to protect from failures and disasters. And S3 provides you the multi-layered security suite that Rajesh discussed earlier, as operational performance for us is second only to security. And S3 is also highly available. So that way you have access to your data when you need it most. We provide 99.99% availability for our frequent access storage classes. And this helps you quickly recover your data from any failures that you might have. S3 achieves this automatically by distributing data across multiple availability zones within a region. And which, as I mentioned earlier, are independent data centers. So this way, if any of these availability zones becomes unavailable, you still have access to your data. And comparing this with your on-premises environment, you no longer have to manage your data growth by adding twice or thrice the capacity to have the same level of availability and durability that S3 provides in a single region. Now, let's look at some of the specific S3 features that apply to data protection. And the first feature we're going to dive into is S3 bucket versioning. By enabling S3 bucket versioning on your buckets, you can protect your data against any accidental deletes. And S3 bucket versioning forms the foundation to data protection in S3. So we recommend that you enable this feature to take advantage of all the other S3 capabilities we're going to talk about in, in the upcoming slides. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind with data protection is that it is not just sufficient for you to have multiple copies of your data replicated. This is because over time, any sort of errors, modifications, or corruptions that, uh, that happens to your data, all of those will also get copied over to those replicated data sets. So you need a mechanism there just to be able to roll back to a previous state of your object. And uh, you know, that's where S3 bucket versioning can help you. So every time you upload an object with the same key, what we are going to do is we're going to maintain a new version of it. And this way, you can go back to a previous version of the object uh, by doing a get and uh, by doing a get against the uh, the key name as well as the particular version ID uh, for that object. So that way, it tracks changes over time. Now, versioning protects against unintentional deletes as well, right? So if you issue a delete in an object, and uh, and and so what we do on on our side is we place a delete marker 
to make it look like the object um, actually doesn't exist. But an administrator with proper permissions could go back and remove that delete marker to get you access to that data, right? So this way you can roll back the deletes and get access to any deleted objects. And you, you can also use lifecycle uh, policies and lifecycle rules to manage the stack of versions that you've built over time. So this way you can either expire these versioned objects or transition them to a more cost-effective storage class um, depending on what your needs are. Now, the next feature we'll look at is S3 replication. And uh, what S3 replication is, is, is an automatic way uh, for you to be able to make identical copies of your data. And from a data protection perspective, S3 replication lets you create copies of your data sets to provide you business continuity and disaster recovery protection. So you can replicate your data from a single source bucket to multiple destination buckets in the same AWS region with sing a same region replication, or use different or replicate to different regions with cross-region replication. We also have two-way replication for object metadata, and this is a way for you to be able to create shared data sets across multiple regions. And you know, this way you can keep the object metadata in sync across all of these buckets. If you, ha if you have the need for a predictable replication backed by an SLA, that's where S S3 replication time control can help you. And what it, what it lets you do is replicate objects within 15 minutes of, of you uploading them. So this way, you know, it, it helps you define a 15 minute recovery point objective for those critical workloads that you may have. And lastly, S3 replication also helps you replicate the data to a bucket with retention controls to protect that data from any malicious intent or rogue administrators. And this brings us to our, our next feature, which is S3 object lock. Now, we built S3 object lock for customers who had compliance requirements that required them to make their data immutable for a period of time. So with S3 object lock, you can enforce retention controls for each object, uh, and that prevents anyone from modifying or deleting data in S3. So you can add these retention controls on every object put request or use a bucket level default to set a retention period on all the objects uh, that land in that, in that bucket. For the retention period that you've set uh, with the retain until date, object versions cannot be overwritten or deleted. You have the option to extend the retention period or use a legal hold, which is an indefinite, uh, uh, indef indefinite block on any overwrites or uh, deletes that, you might, uh, uh, that someone might do but there's no way for you to be able to reduce the retention period um, until the reta retain until date. And lastly, we provide you ways to audit and review these retention uh, information of, of every object using S3 inventory reports and object level event notifications. So you have two retention modes with S3 object lock and they're the compliance mode where a protected object version cannot be overwritten or deleted by any user, including the root user of your AWS account. And you have the governance mode where users can't overwrite or delete any object versions or alter the lock settings unless they have special, special permissions. We also have a legal hold capability that I talked about in the previous slide. And what that lets you do is, is block any modifications or uh, any deletions for an indefinite period of time. Now, you can use it if you had any sort of active litigation or if you have an upcoming audit of your data or for any reason where you want to continue to maintain that object in a write once, read many, or warm state. Now, S3 Object Lock makes your data truly immutable and you can use this capability to safely store immutable copies of your data and protect them against any malicious activity. So with S3, you also have an array of storage classes that lets you optimize the cost based on how quickly you want to be able to access and restore that data in case you need it. On the left, you see uh, the S3 standard and S3 infrequent access that provides you millisecond access. And this is where we recommend you store your frontline backup uh, data, and that way you can retrieve them very quickly. Most of the enterprise uh, backup vendors, uh, what they do is they, they support S3 standard, and so it's easy for you to get started. 
You can also use the more cost-effective storage classes, such as the S3 Glacier and S3 uh, Glacier Deep Archive for data that you don't need to restore as quickly. And this could be for secondary or tertiary copies of your data, or you could use this for uh, use this storage class if you need to keep data around for any compliance reasons. So with the, the S3 storage classes, you don't have to worry about maintaining different media types in your on-premises environment. And this way, you also don't have to manage any separate logistics for offsite backups that you might need to take for compliance reasons. You can use S3 and its suite of data protection features to easily get started with your data protection journey in the cloud. But what if you're already in the AWS cloud and you want a way to be able to protect your cloud resources? And that's where we have AWS Backup, which is, uh, which is a, a backup service that works across AWS resources, where, uh, which can help you. And AWS Backup is a fully managed backup service that makes it easy for you to centralize and automate data protection and backup of data across all of your AWS services. With AWS Backup, you no longer need to manage data protection of your resources in AWS separately within every individual service. And AWS Backup lets you centralize your data protection across all of your resources. As of today, we support nine AWS services with AWS Backup, and this includes AWS uh, Amazon EC2 instances, EBS volumes, RDS uh, databases, including Aurora clusters, as well as DynamoDB tables. And for files, uh, uh, for file services, we, we support EFS, FSx for Lester, and FSx for Windows File Server. And last but definitely not the least, we also support AWS Storage Gateway volumes. So now let's take a look at how AWS Backup works. So customers really like that AWS Backup is a cloud native service and it works in the same microservices architecture that customers have developed on AWS. So AWS Backup covers the nine services that I talked about earlier and we continue to expand that list of services that we support at each year. And at the heart of the AWS Backup service are backup plans that help you orchestrate backup operations across your AWS services. So with these backup plans, you, have, you can set up the, the frequency of your backups, the backup window when you want, it, want uh, AWS Backup to take those backups, and also configure tags to automatically enroll resources into those backup plans. We enlist the help of Amazon SNS, AWS CloudTrails, and, uh, and AWS CloudWatch uh, to set up notifications, logging, and monitoring for AWS Backup. We scale through AWS organizations using backup policies that lets you backup resources across accounts and across regions and store backup artifacts within backup vaults. You can use these policies to automatically enroll your resources from across your AWS organization. We utilize AWS IAM, and this way you can secure and authorize access to both backup and restore operations, giving you the flexibility and ensuring that only authorized users can perform necessary actions on those, uh, on those backups that you've stored in those backup vaults. And finally, you can set up detailed compliance reports with AWS Backup Audit Manager to make it easy for you to be able to monitor and, uh, and provide uh, audit reports when you need to. So we'll take a look at some of these features in more detail now. And the first one is uh, the AWS Backup Vault Lock feature. So this is something that we recently launched and it's a cool new feature that lets you protect your backups against any malicious or accidental actions, similar to what we had with the S3 object lock capability. Using this feature, you can block any deletions or any changes to the retention period of your backups in your backup vault. So no one, including the root user, can delete the backups and the same holds true for lifecycle changes such as retention or transition to cold storage settings. And this makes AWS backup truly immutable, right? So the vault lock configuration is attached to a backup vault and uh, this is where you can enable this feature and you can enable it either using the AWS uh, uh, backup APIs, CLI or the SDK. We also have another new feature which is the AWS backup audit manager which we recently launched and now with, with this feature, you can simplify data governance and compliance uh, management of your backups. 
So by using the built-in customizable controls and defining parameters, you can essentially audit your backups to see if they satisfy your organization's requirements. And the audit manager automatically tracks these backup activities and detects if any of your backups drift from your defined parameters. So this way you can take quick action to make sure that all of your resources are, uh, are, are within the compliance posture that you require. And you can also generate periodic or on-demand reports to demonstrate that uh, the compliance of your uh, control parameters. Um, and this is something that you can basically pass on to auditors and regulators who might need to see this from time to time. So we, we looked at the data protection goals and you know, this is where all the AWS capabilities that we talked about essentially help you uh, achieve those goals, right? So the first one is protecting your data from accidental deletes. And this is where S3 bucket versioning can help you uh, uh, roll back to a previous version of, uh, of your object. And with backup policies in AWS backup, uh, you have an easy way for you to be able to backup your, uh, all of your uh, resources in the cloud. Now, for replicating your data, you have capabilities with AWS uh, uh, Backup and Amazon S3 to be able to replicate your data across accounts and regions. And specifically, if you want an SLA-backed replication, you have S3 uh, replication time control to, to help you with that, to achieve a 15-minute RPO. And then when it comes to protecting your data for compliance and governance, S3 Object Lock and the AWS Backup Vault Lock feature provides you an immutable storage uh, solution uh, to store uh, your worm data, right? So now that we've looked at all of these ingredients, uh, Rajesh will walk us through the data protection solutions you can build uh, within your business that can help you satisfy these goals. Now that we have heard from Aditya about all the key ingredients that AWS storage offers from S3 and AWS backup, you must be wondering, how do you put these ingredients to good use, right? How can you use this for your specific implementation? So let's first go back to our data protection journey. Well, as I mentioned, customers usually start with the backup restore use case. So we'll look into this particular use case and how customers implement these solutions. So what are the key considerations when it comes to backup? Basically, you, why do you even backup data? You backup data because if something happens to the data, you need a fresh new copy of data that you can fall back into and retrieve that golden copy of data. One of the key goals that customers have here is minimize the time to recover when some event happens, right? Uh, the other goal is minimize the amount of data that is lost. We could say, okay, go ahead and back up all your data every minute you have a backup copy, but then we need to balance the cost with the business risk, right? So we we have to look at what the uh, how much the business can withstand, and then decide on the RPO, RTO, SLAs, right? So let's look into a traditional backup environment. Uh, you have some application servers. There are probably backup servers and appliances that are managing and cataloging the data from these appliances. The backup servers could be hard drive based or SSD based. Uh, for you to quickly restore the back uh, data back from the backup appliances. You might even be storing data on tape media, or you might be using third-party bunkers, right, to, you know, store your uh, long-term archival copy, right? What we have observed is in, this, in these scenarios, there is way too much data to be managed and handled. Uh, you, your backup data keeps growing, you need to keep buying appliances, uh, these are very vulnerable, right? Uh, you're trying to secure these backups from cyber attacks and unauthorized deletions. Finally, it's also very fragile. So you don't even know if it is durable. Will you be even able to recover when an event happens, right? Uh, the cost is a big factor. So having uh, two sets of appliances available in two different regions, making sure there is synchronous or asynchronous replication, the whole strategy is too complicated and engineering starts to spend way more time on backup policies than actually creating value to the customers. So uh, let us look at how AWS can, you know, modernize this backup, right? So 
As I mentioned, typically for uh, uh, on-prem customers, they uh, involve a e hybrid infrastructure strategy. This is the easiest way for customers to dip their toes into the cloud. Customers often look at migrating the backup data and then you know, making sure that they archive it in the uh, correct S3 class of storage or Glacier, right? So uh, by doing this, customers are able to enjoy the advantage of a scalable, durable, and low-cost storage from AWS. As Aditya mentioned, within S3, we have different classes of storage, and customers are able to uh, back up to any of the classes depending on the SLAs. Customers looking at a hybrid option, they can use AWS storage gateways that presents itself as a virtual tape library. There is also iSCSI volumes that are present in the volume gateway. There is also a file storage gateway target. So by doing this methodology, um, you know, customers can use their data on premises and they can also uh, back up some of their data into S3 because uh, the S3 APIs are available. And even if you have a third party vendor, they, we have connectors uh, from S3 to them. So they are able to back up that data from uh, Commvault or Veritas. Again, moving to the cloud definitely reduces the cost. In fact, one of the customers recently mentioned that they were able to eliminate 30,000 tapes from their monthly backup mechanism, and they were able to save by more than 50% of their costs. There are different ways, multiple ways to connect with AWS. Almost all the backup vendors, they either natively integrate with AWS services such as S3, or they also integrate with AWS backup service, right? So for data that is already in the cloud, you can still deploy a Veritas or Commvault. It, it can still get backed up within the cloud using AWS backup. We'll spend more time on the implementation in subsequent slides. I'd like to show you some of the backup partners, right? We have what is called the uh, AWS partner network. So these APN partners, some of them are on this slide. We have made sure that their technologies work seamlessly with AWS. Uh, their connectors are able to work with uh, the S3 APIs and they are able to backup data in different classes of S3, right? So these have been validated uh, for their technical proficiency. You can go to the partner network QR code there to find other partners that you might be already working on. Now that we have covered the backup restore use case and implementation, let's build on those strategies and see how you can address your ransomware recovery strategy. This is top of mind for every CIO out there. So ransomware, ransomware threats are rampant. Hackers are finding different ways to get into your environment, right? This has become one of the hottest topics in the industry. You must be familiar with uh, either the colonial pipeline attack or most recently, uh, one of the meat suppliers, JBS, got affected. They had to pay close to like five or $11 million in Bitcoins to get back from that ransomware. So according to one of the recent studies by Gartner, 75% uh, of IT organizations will face one form of ransomware or other between now and 2025. That's a staggering number. Imagine out of every four company, three of them getting hit with some form of malware, right? Uh, the other statistic that is staggering is, uh, you know, uh, global businesses in 2021 alone, they'll fall victim to ransomware every 11 seconds, right? And this used to be like 14 or 15 seconds in 2019. It's gone down to 11 seconds. And they're going to spend close to like $20 billion just in 2021 uh, to get back their data from these hackers. Let's, let's look at, like we keep talking about ransomware. What is actually ransomware, right? So ransomware is refers to any malicious cyber attack from hackers, right? So there are two types of ransomware. There is the mass delete ransomware type and there is the mass re-encrypt ransomware. So in the case of the mass delete ransomware, it basically involves hackers getting into the system, locking users out of their data, out of their devices and applications. The second type is more sophisticated. They encrypt all the data. It involves sophisticated techniques to get back all that data and sometimes even involves paying cryptocurrencies so that 
the hackers uh, don't have a way for anybody to you know backtrack into who did the hack when do ransomware attacks happen right so we have typically found companies where technical maintenance is behind schedule right the patching of the os or any updates on the software applications if they are not done in time that's uh, a loophole for hackers to get in. Second is human factor. Several companies still don't understand the social engineering or phishing concepts, so employees are susceptible to ransomware attacks. Thirdly, even if companies know about this, sometimes they don't have a CISO-based you know, governance model. So in case of an attack, they don't know how they need to, you know, approach uh, security consultants or there is no proper governance to deal with these attacks right so th these are in, uh, use cases when the hackers take control of the situation and uh, introduce more rans ransomware into the system let's quickly look into an anatomy of a ransomware event so uh, I'll take you through the first 12 hours uh, this uh, we we've gathered these uh, um, information from some of the recent news that we've seen. So the first 12 hours, right, what happens? First, uh, one of the hackers infiltrates into the system. Uh, one of the employees gets a fake email that has that looks like a, a valid uh, software application. They end up clicking it. Uh, and then malware gets uh, into the Windows OS login, the Active Directory writes, everything gets corrupted, right? Then the attack starts spreading through the system, right? The IP phones are down, the emails are not working, uh, the IT team starts getting calls from the users, right? At this point, the IT team starts isolating the environment and they even resort to using personal email or cell phones for all kind of communications. I really wouldn't want to be in their sho shoes when something like this happens, right? Uh, the business teams get involved, uh, depending on the nature of the attack, they sometimes have to involve FBI or they need to issue a PO to a security consultant to take stock of the situation. The IT storage administration team starts recovering from local snapshots. Uh, you know, it increases the latency in the system uh, and it becomes a painful process, right? They also have to sometimes scrap the affected servers or laptops and they have to buy new gear. For that, it takes, you know, three to four weeks. And still at the end of three or four weeks, the company is not back to normal. They are still limping back. They are trying to regain some amount of data. They probably end up paying some, fine, some kind of ransom. But these are things that we don't want any of the AWS customers to go through, right? So let's look at some of the implementations for ransomware. When we talk about ransomware, we have the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST framework. There are different elements when it comes to ransomware. That is to identify a ransomware attack has happened, to protect yourself from ransomware, to detect what has happened, how many, uh, what parts of your system are affected, and how do you respond, right? Those are all the main pillars. Uh, the recovery is the fifth pillar and that is where we are going to spend our time today so when you come up with a ransomware recovery strategy you need to first figure out what is the most important part of your data that you want to protect uh, should you prioritize the recovery of this data over other parts of your data set do you have an sla for the recovery time or recovery point objectives right and then what trade-offs do you want to make in terms of the budget, time, the manpower, and everything for data completeness? So the key requirements for a ransomware recovery, first thing is the immutability of the critical data. So Aditya talked about S3 object lock, backup vault lock. These are features that AWS has that will help in this regard. Next important characteristic is isolation of the data, both physically and logically isolating copies of the infrastructure templates, the files and applications, right? We have several services in our portfolio, uh, services such as storage gateways, direct connect, these uh, help in this regard. Lastly, we need to use intelligence, right? Uh, so we need to scan the data, make sure that it has not been corrupted. So that's where several machine learning and AI based services come into the picture. So we have Amazon Guard Duty, S3 Storage Lens, Athena. These features can be 
implemented to do forensics on your data and make sure that the copies are clean. Let's now quickly wrap up with some implementations, right? The first approach uh, is extending on the backup and restore capabilities. We already talked about using either native services such as Storage Gateway or third-party backup services such as Commvault and Veritas. You can back it up within S3. And then you can use the S3 object lock to create a vault, right? So this vault will contain the golden copy of the data that you have. And it could be a recipe or critical data that you don't want anybody to, you know, attach or make any changes. Uh, as an example, uh, Veritas is one of our partners. They are fully integrated with S3. They can work with the S3 object lock feature. Um, and they are able to extend data from on-premises to the cloud, and you can implement a ransomware recovery mechanism through them. Similarly, you can work with other backup vendors as well that have implemented this. We currently have a list of uh, four or five partners here, Veeam, Zerto, Veritas, and Commvault. And as I mentioned, they have validated their solutions to work with S3 object lock. You can come up with a uh, write once, read many scheme for uh, ransomware protection. You can again make sure that um, go look at the storage competency partners in the QR code and you can work with your uh, backup and uh, data protection vendors. Now for customers, let's say with data already in the cloud, we do have ransomware recovery implementation. Let's imagine a customer who is running a website on AWS. Uh, you have EC2 instances that are running the web servers. You have block storage through EBS. You also serve files to these applications using EFS, right? So you need to make sure that all these applications, all these services are also protected, right? So first thing when it comes to this implementation is starting with AWS backup service. You can create a backup plan using AWS backup, you can move your critical backup data to a backup vault and manage it securely with key management service. You can also do cross region or cross account backup capabilities with AWS backup that make sure that there are isolated copies of your vault data in different accounts. Um, the backup vault can also be configured with the backup vault lock feature to make these backups immutable. There's also separate credentials that are available between your primary root organization and other organizations. And when a ransomware event occurs, you can go back to the golden copy that is in your AWS backup vault and get it restored. L lastly, uh, to be on top of all these uh, processes, we do have compliance and reporting capabilities coming through AWS Backup Audit Manager. Now, we have customers such as financial institutions that have a sophisticated implementation of this ransomware recovery. So I'll take you through one of the implementations uh, where there are four different accounts that are created and each one has a different purpose. So this is uh, for a customer who has data on premises and they are using the cloud for the backup and ransomware recovery solution. So. Uh, we'll see that data from on-premises comes into the staging account. And uh, from the staging account, you can uh, create a vault account. And this is where the S3 object lock feature comes in. You'll notice that the vault account is only able to pull data into this, right? So there is no push happening from uh, any of the accounts. And then periodically, we have customers who want to keep testing if this data is... Uh, uh, you know, not corrupted, right? So they create a forensic account, right? So this is where they can always check with the golden copy in the vault account and make sure the forensics look okay. Once they are comfortable, then that forensic account goes away and they're able to create a recovery account and where they can get the clean copy data from the vault. And then at that point, they can decide uh, about their recovery mechanism. They can either get it back onto on-premises or they can take it to another cloud if they have a recovery strategy there. If you would like to learn more about these kind of ransomware recovery strategies, there are multiple uh, deep dive sessions and chalk talks uh, available in reInvent. I would recommend you go take a look at them. 
So now that we have looked at the backup and ransomware recovery strategies for your data, we shall look at some of the ways to do a disaster recovery, right? So when it comes to disaster recovery, we would like to take a step back and look at the holistic applications, right? Not just storage. So let's look into what is a disaster, right? So disaster comes in different shapes. You know, you're aware of the natural disasters like a flood or an earthquake. That could be a technical failure in a colo location. One of the storage arrays may stop functioning, hard drive failures. And there could be human actions too, right? Like uh, one of the storage administrators deletes data by mistake or a ransomware attack happens, right? Each of these disasters have different implications, right? It could be local, it could be regional, it could be countrywide or global, right? Depending on the nature of these disasters and your job geographical impact, you need to have this different DR plans. For example, if it's just a local flooding issue uh, affecting only one data center, th then you could have a multi-availability zone strategy wherein you can keep your data working from the other availability zone. But if it's an attack that's going to take down all your data in all the regions that you have, then you need to have much more sophisticated strategies. So uh, these are four different ways that customer use for disaster recovery. So on the left of the spectrum that we have is the simple backup and restore strategy. So uh, when it comes to backup and restore, the metrics that we mentioned, RPO and RTO, those are going to be high. Um, it could take hours or even you know days to get back all the data depending on what class of storage you had it stored. In the middle, we have the pilot light and warm standby strategy. These uh, offer a good balance of benefits versus cost. The RPO and RTO, if you look at that, is, a, is going to be in the order of tens of minutes or sometimes down to even minutes, right? Lastly, the, on the extreme right is the multi-site active-active uh, strategy. In this case, it's almost real time, right? Uh, RPO and RTO are near zero. Uh, this is going to be the most expensive of all DR strategies uh, because you have applications running on uh, two different sites, right? So um, it, it is important to consider your SLAs, your, you know, uh, what is it that your business can withstand uh, when you think about adopting any of these strategies. So let's look into the first uh, strategy, pilot light. So Cloud Endure is one of the leading data migration and DR solution providers. It's a part of AWS. Uh, the value proposition of Cloud Endure is it simplifies and reduces the cost of DR by offering a very highly automated solution. So uh, Cloud Endure continuously replicates your machines, including your OS uh, database and files into a low cost staging area in your target AWS uh, account and preferred region. In case a disaster happens, you can instruct Cloud Endure to you know, orchestrate and immediately launch thousands of your machines to fully provision state, right? So uh, this is kind of a lightweight staging area-based strategy. So when a disaster happens, in case of a failover event, the orchestration engine automatically launches all these workloads. Uh, in terms of the cost, because you are only using it in a passive state, you incur, incur only a fraction of the cost when compared to an active active environment. The application scaling is also managed by the Cloud Endure orchestration engine. So the process after you instruct Cloud Endure to you know, uh, cre create this failover data, the process is fairly fast. Let's look into the warm standby. So warm standby approach is just an extension of the uh, pilot light mechanism that we talked about. In this case, there is a scaled down but fully functional copy of your production data in another region. So this extends the pilot like concept. The uh, time to recover is still in the order of minutes. Um, in this approach, you can also do testing or periodically check if you have a firm uh, disaster recovery strategy. On the left, on this picture, you see the primary data center with infrastructure that is active. The right is uh, the recovery region that is passive until a failover event happens, right? So when something happens to the primary side, 
uh, the uh, the infrastructure on the right takes over and uh, you you come back to business right so you can keep your business going so the primary difference between pilot light and warm standby is pilot light cannot process requests without any additional action from you versus warm standby can handle traffic almost immediately in the pilot light approach you will have to turn on the servers on the right side and scale up versus on the warm standby you just have to scale up right so it's already available in a passive state Next, we'll look into the multi-site active-active approach. In this case, uh, there is actually, you know, zero, near zero RPO and RTO because you're, you're running your applications on both sides, right? There is a primary and there is also a secondary site and all your applications are running on both sides. In fact, when a failover uh, event happens, uh, there is actually there is no such thing as a failover right so one of the sites goes down the other sites is anyways it's functioning it's going to take it up and your businesses keep going right so this is the most expensive or the um, near zero rpo rto strategy for uh, disaster recovery in summary uh, we've covered the backup use case we've extended it to cover the ransomware recovery strategy and we took a step back and looked at different approaches to do disaster recovery we in the process we were able to cover some of the aws features such as s3 object lock and also aws backup service features that will help you towards your data protection goals we do have other chalk talk and deep dive sessions in reInvent. We encourage you to attend those and uh, continue your data protection journey with AWS. Thank you.